Indeed on Vagi Vagi UN TV with our very special guest, Brian Booth Craig. Hello. <laughs> Th- hello, Tori. Thank you for having me. I'm looking oh, forward to this conversation. It's definitely a pleasure. I absolutely love, love, love your story. And I just love your journey that I've read about, that I've watched. And mm-hmm. I think you're truly an amazing role model, um, professional. And um, I guess let's just dive right into everything. Um, is sure, it safe to sure. say that you are a four-time award-winning contemporary sculptor? Yes, I am. Full-time. <laughs> in bronze. Because yeah. In bronze. <laughs> yeah. I feel like that's part of your signature and who the artist behind your work mm. is. Um, which was yeah, the, mat- the materiality. The, materi- right. the material, you mean? Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Oh, that's that's awesome. So I want to start off with a quote. Um, sure. I want to quote you, actually. And I think it's, I'm going to quote you a few times because it's so inspiring. And it's so, I, I, don't, I just feel like the passion behind your words and the, the certain mm-hmm. descriptions you use is just pretty, pretty amazing. Mm-hmm. All right. So one of you said, you start off with this raw material, shapeless, formless, and you suddenly can make something that has a presence to it. That's what I think sculpture does. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Do you want me to, do you want me to unpack that a little bit? Yes. That's exactly what I'm getting into. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I think um, what it, what it gets to the heart of to me is something in human nature that, uh, that we all remember from our childhood, which is that the world is an animated space. Right. That the right. that the objects around us are not simply raw material for our consumption and raw material for for uh, some sort of financial gain. Uh, but that the raw material of the earth and our surroundings and our objects around us are animated by something in the universe. Right. right. And that as an as an artist, what's exciting about that experience of making something is that you can make it animated in a new way that you can give it a sort of presence and a life and psychological impact on the viewer uh, that the raw material didn't have in its original state. It had some other uh, eminence to it, but I, uh, I'm really a big believer in that idea. And, you know, if you go back to, if you go back to the, um, uh, to the early, early uh, artwork, I mean, people will say primitive. I think that's, you know, sometimes used as a pejorative term, but I don't think it is a pejorative term. I think it's, right. you know, we're all, we're all, it's just a primal thing, a basic thing, right. an essential quality to be of human nature to want to find shape in the world and give it meaning, right? Right. And you go all the way back to the Venus of Willendorf and, and those, those talismanic little figurines that were made out of clay and fi- or carved right. out of a little piece of stone. Um, they have a magic to them that I find really exciting. And that's the sen- that's the feeling I get when, when, wow. when the material starts to, when the material starts to take a shape that is partly unexpected because you can't plan it all. You know, you can't, you can't know beforehand everything that's going to happen when you right. start manipulating the material. That yeah. is magic to me. That's, that's what I'm describing. Wow. It's that sense of mat- uh, magic transformation and, and the enlivening quality that the material conveys when you're in its presence. So, um, and, you know, I was one of those kids who, like when I was young, who, you know, if I had a, if I had a toy, it was, to me, it was, it was alive. It was a real thing, you know, right, right. um, you know, my pets were like my friends, you know, like I, yeah. I, I felt like the world was alive. Everything around me was kind of alive. Right. I, and I think that shapes that. Kind of who I am as an artist. Wow. Yeah. I, I wish we could get back. I wish we could get back to that a little bit in our culture, right. That people would treat the world with that kind of living presence. Right, right. Absolutely. You know, that's a great imagination. That's a great um, awareness, you know, Um, Mm. being aware at such a young age, giving things life, it's beyond, it's beyond extraordinary, you know? And I think that's where the creator Mm. side of you comes in, right? And even me as a child, like I've always was creative, you know, and you you Mm. speaking of your childhood, I know at a very young age, you know, your mom, your mother, um, she realized the artistic um, greatness in you, right? She, she, at six years old, she put you in an art class. Um, Yep. 
Yeah, and yeah with a local artist. Band. Yeah, yeah, and I, I absolutely yeah. love that. And yeah. and you mentioned in your short film um, that having a support, you know, a lot of people don't have that. Right. I think that's really important. I, wherever that comes from, you know, um, it, for people, some people it's their parents, some people it's a mentor, for some people it's a, a teacher, a colleague, whatever it might be. I think it's really vital to have that. And for me, it was right. my mother, for sure. Absol that's absolutely. That's such a blessing, for sure. Yeah, you for know, sure. I can definitely relate to that because um, my mom saw the creativity in me, whether if I was mm. doing uh, dancing ballet mm. being a gymnast or doing what i do today and conducting interviews mm. and having that mm. media personality in me she always supported like till this day supports it and like i always that's fantastic for feedback and i i yeah. keep watching uh you talk about her and you know you still picture her responses to your sculptures and to how she mm. reads the expressions i think that's that that's amazing you know, that's definitely, yeah, I, it really is. A, it's a, it's definitely a gift to have something like that. Like having, like you said, your mother uh, supporting you and encouraging oh, yeah. and, and, you know, f helping you. I mean, really what the parent parenting is, is a guiding that somebody into their, into their path in life. Right. right. And, uh, and she, she definitely did a good job with me. So uh, oh. I'm very grateful. Oh my gosh. That's a beautiful thing. It truly is. And um, I know that was, you started, you know, young, painting, drawing, uh, sculpture. Right. Sculpture didn't come until later on in your 20s. Correct. But during your teenage years, I know you mentioned that you, you know, you used to play with clay and make things. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where mm -hmm. you kind of draw your interest, right? To being able to yeah. create yeah. things. But one thing that I right. also find interesting is that um, you were also able to reverse engineer. So, right. Like, tell me a little bit about that. I absolutely love yeah. that because I'm the type of person to take something apart and like rebuild it <laughs> or try to make it my own. Um, some things yeah. didn't turn out so good and other things it, it I did pretty well. So tell me a little bit about your ver reverse engineering at such a young age as a teenager. Yeah. So what, what actually that's comes a little bit later when I started sculpting in college. I, okay. so what I mean, what I mean by that is that, you know, when I was, when I was in undergraduate school, we didn't have the, the, the education I had was very, um, very much in the, in the contemporary art education mold. So there wasn't really right. any instruction in, in representational forms, uh, figure drawing right. or figure sculpting. And so I spent a lot of time just going to the library, checking out books uh, about sculpture, whether it was Michelangelo or Rodin or just all kinds of things, Giacometti could be anything. And looking at the way that they um, look at the final product and the way that they made things, the tool right. marks that they used. And from those, from, from those clues, I started to reverse engineer the kinds of tools that they used and techniques that they employed. And so, I mean, it's a little bit of a tedious way of learning because you have to, you have to, it's almost like being being an, uh, an investigator trying to right. you know looking through books and see pick up information where you can but there's a there's a particular advantage to doing things that way um, rather than having it just told you um, it, it it's because it's self it was self-motivated and because right. I I was I was really digging for the information uh, I think I I think I didn't take it for granted when I did get the opportunity to learn things from other people because I I knew that how precious the knowledge was and um, and then we can't take we can't take those things for granted at all and it doesn't matter what field you're in this just right. happens to be my story with this particular form of artwork that i do but it was a key part of my development was learning to learning to educate myself in some ways so uh, self -taught because I didn't as well that. to a very large degree yeah to a very large degree. for this particular wow. kind of work yes to a very large degree like you know probably 90 percent self-taught so, wow. uh, you know, th and, and in some ways that, again, there's an advantage to that as an artist, because you're not, you're not being told a particular style of doing right. something, right. You're not being told, this is the right way. This is the wrong way. You're, you're trying to find the right way for what it is you want to say and for what it is you want to do. Now, the downside of course, is that it requires a lot of individual effort and, uh, and, and it's a little bit slower gathering information, but, but I think you have to, 
in life, you have to see the advantage as well as the disadvantage of whatever situation you're in. Right. So I think that's how I, that's how I look back on it. I try to focus on the positive side of that, you know, that, you know, information gathering and self-education. Right. Uh, right. Even though sometimes, even though sometimes when I was younger, I kind of wished that I had someone just to tell me, you know, here's how you do it. <laughs> you know? Right. But right. Uh, it's okay. That's okay. You have, I feel like since a very Go young ahead. age, you were kind of just figuring things out on your own. Um, as far yeah. even as far as back as six year old you, like you were already picking up things, creating things, and it's just like that's yeah. just embedded in you. It's just who you are, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And speaking of, um, I guess in your early twenties, um, mm. you know, well, you you went to Penn State. And yep. as, as well as um, the New York Art um, Academy. New, New York Academy of Art, yep. New York mm -hmm. Art, I said that backwards, didn't I? <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so I know at, during some point you put a pause, right? And you even went pre-med, yeah. you went um, even business. But what truly drew you back to art? Besides missing it, mm. and besides having that void, if it's okay to say, um, what else yeah. really drew you back? Well, those two things for certain. I mean, I was definitely missing it, and I always, I always was, uh, you know, I always felt like I was an artist. And you know, one of the things about our country is that we're a very practically minded country. Like, you, if you don't have an occupation that that feeds this, feeds the machine, you know, whatever the industrial machine that capitalist machine is if you don't fit into that you're you're kind of discouraged right so right. uh when i was when i was in high school i was you know i remember guidance counselor telling me um you should you know don't don't go into art because you know that's a hard way to make money you know and it was kind of discouraging me and particularly because i was a good student i was a, i was a straight a student they said well wow. why would you want to study art why why don't you go do something you know like you know go to med school or something i don't know you know and it stuck in my head for a few years that, that that was the proper way to proceed through life. But I wasn't happy uh, studying other things. It wasn't that I right. didn't enjoy the subjects. I just knew that that I was more, I was most happy when I was creating things. Right. Um, so there was missing it. But then the other thing was my mother actually came back again. And you know, she was, she basically said to me, you know, when are you going to start making art again? Like when, it, you know, you should really pursue this. And that's when I was, I finally said, you know what? Yeah, she's, uh, that's what I need to do. So there's right. a little bit of a detour there, but, but that's okay. I don't think detours are always bad. Yeah, I don't think detours are always bad. You learn a lot about yourself in right. those moments in life when you feel like you've gone on a path. I, yeah. I definitely agree. I've tried, you know, quite a few different majors, and I get, keep getting drawn back to doing what I'm doing right now. What you love. <laughs> and, and exactly, and what I love, and being a creator. And, you know, when people ask me, what do you do? Oh, I am a creator. <laughs> I'm crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, in the beginning, right, your your mm. your first sculpture piece was a portrait, um, correct? Which you still have today. <laughs> I do. It's sitting right. It's sitting right on the shelf over there that in is my studio. Awesome. That is super amazing. Do you ever like show that as a reference? Because I know you do workshops and you I, do instruct. Do you ever show mm -hmm, like, hey, listen, mm -hmm. I went from this to. I mean, a full-size bronze sculpture. Yeah. Full of detail. Yeah. yeah. I do. I do show people that because um, I can show them things that I like think that I was doing back then, teaching myself how to look and how to how to how to manipulate the clay. I can show. Right. I can. I demonstrate to the students that. But uh, but mostly, I, mostly I you know I just keep it up there as for for myself for That's sentimental awesome. reasons. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And she was a, yeah, and the, and the and the the woman who posed for me, she was a fellow student. She was a painting student, and her name's Leslie Ramos. And I like lost touch with her. So every time I do an interview, that I have a chance to say her name. I'm always like Leslie. So I'm I'm hoping one day she'll pop Let's up. Find and, her. And Let's say, find her. Let's find her. Yeah, exactly. Her. I'll, I'll research her. Yeah. <laughs> Let me. So. Um, like some journalist work for you. <laughs> I'll definitely keep her name in mind for sure. Um, and speak of your learning time period, I know you mentioned learning. Um, mm -hmm. It's like a language, right? And it's like right, you're translating right. to yourself and you're talking to yourself and, and you kind of have trouble um, 
at a young age until mm-hmm. you reach the point to where you no longer needed the translator and you understood fluently your your right. work of art or the process. So how right. did you come up with and and that explanation it just mm-hmm. made sense to me. And it was so easy Yeah, to I think Yeah, you can think of lots of analogies for that. Like think of like um someone playing music, right? And they have to learn, they have to learn where all of they're learning to play piano and they have to learn where all the all the notes are on the keyboard. They need to learn all of the all of the, the, the pedal arrangements. They need to right. learn how to read music. Like these are the these are the this is the syntax of making music. And without learning those, you you don't have the freedom to just let go of all of that information in the moment and make something. And it's the same with sculpting or drawing. You know, that there are fundamental bits of uh, information and movements that you make, sort of muscle memories right. that you make with your hand, right? Uh, whether it's a drawing or a painting or a sculpture. And these are these are things that only can be mastered through repetition and through an amount of, a degree of reflective attentiveness that re, that is constantly self-assessing. And then what it's it's like magic once you get it once you under once that becomes integrated into your being, and it just sort of flows out as you're working uh, and that's why that's why i use the analogy of learning a language where you no longer have to think in translation like I don't, in other words if i'm looking at a, i had a model here just to, just before you, you you and i got on um right. i had a model for four hours and i had him in a pose and he um and of course i'm looking at anatomical features but i'm not thinking of them as a student would and say okay there is the patella there's the tibia and there's the femur. Okay, and this is how they fit together. Like I'm not doing that. Like I'm not doing that linguistically in my mind, right? Or right. Rationally, but when I was learning, I was doing that rationally. I had because I had to. I had to. I had to like learn the language of the visual language, how it connected to my knowledge language, and then once those two things started to integrate, I no longer had to think anymore. I no longer had to translate in my mind it's, what I was it looking came at, to you naturally and so it flows well. out. Right, it starts to just come out of you, just like, like I said, just like speaking a foreign language. Once it, you become fluent, you no longer translate the words. The words are directly related to the meaning of the thing that you're trying to convey. Right. So, so it's a magical feeling. Oh wow! Yeah, it's absolutely. Great. Even the way you're just expressing it and explaining it, I, I, I feel passion behind even speaking mm-hmm. with you, um, and I see the passion within your work, and but not only that you're full of wisdom you're so wise like it's just incredible um and speaking of posing um i know you consider the pose a collaboration between you and your model right Let's right well a little bit yeah that's a great topic because i think uh oftentimes when we he- when we read about artists who use models we think of the we think of the model as just sort of raw material that's at the that's sort of being manipulated in the mind of the of the artist. But I don't really see it that way. I think that whenever you're when, as an artist, whatever I'm looking at, whatever that subject may be, I'm I'm looking for a conversation. So I'm looking for uh, bits of information coming from them that I can't preconceive, right? right. Because because you know there, there's this there's this kind of mistaken notion in the Western world now of this this idea of the like the the sort of lone genius who can sort of who can call into into being these vast universes of creativity and the reality is that all of us are limited beings right, right. i i have my limits of of knowledge and experience and um and creative resources that i can call upon right so i'm constantly looking for other sources to give me more information and so with the models I like the fact that they are coming into the situation in the studio with their own set of experiences, their own bodies, their own way of moving in the world, right? Their own way of expressing themselves with the language of their, of their body. And so when I'm working with the model, I'm looking for, I'm looking for things that they do that are unique. Right. And that I wasn't expecting. Like I, in fact, I like to, when, when I have, when I book a model, I like to try not to think of an idea before they arrive. Right. I try not to because I don't want to I don't want to I don't want to dictate the terms of everything to my artwork. My artwork is the receptacle for an experience that's happening with me and the model and the material. Right. 
And it's that right. three-way conversation that results in the object. And in some way, in some regards, as an artist, you have to learn to get out of the way a little bit and and let the let the let the subject say something in the process. Uh, and I find that when I'm open, when I have the more open I am like that, the 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 more I think the more so a I'm more surprised, and I feel like the results are always a little bit better. Right. Uh, so yeah, it's okay. I'm not forcing it to be something. Oh, I'm sorry. Is is it okay to say? No, go ahead. Yeah. Off guard moments are kind of the best moments to capture. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, it's so, you know, for example, like sometimes when I when I have a model, they they um, at first they're kind of nervous, you know, because it's a vulnerable position to be in, and, and you know they they know they're being looked at, and it can be a little self conscious, but and they'll tr I'll ask them to pose, and they'll take a pose, and they're they're trying too hard, and then I'll just tell them to change the pose, and in the middle of moving. I'll say stop, like right in the middle of like moving positions. Like I see right. something, a gesture that, that where they're no longer conscious of what they're doing. And in that lack of consciousness, they're themselves. Right. And then I pick up, then I try to pick up on that. So uh, that to me is part of the, again, part of the magic of it. And sometimes, you know, even the, the person I'm working with will throw out an idea and say, well, what if I do, what if I'm holding this object or what if I'm, um, what if I'm doing something else with, with right. my arm over here and, and that will spark like something in my mind and I'll just follow it, you know? I mean, essentially I'm looking for any kind of magic that can happen wherever it might happen. And I feel like my job as an artist is, is to be a conduit for an experience, right? It's about, it's not, it's not, I'm not a preacher speaking on behalf of somebody else or something else. I'm just a vessel through which an experience flows and finds form. You know, I'm, I'm, I only, I only am speaking about what I, what I'm experiencing in the studio with the material and with the person and, you know, right. with this life journey. It's, it's, um, I, I don't want to, I don't ever want to feel like I'm claiming too much for myself as a, as some sort of font of, like you said, wise. I, uh, I'm very like shy about saying that. Like I, I would like to think that I'm still like in progress of learning <laughs> to be to oh, be wiser yeah. and more open. Right. No, you're so. full of wisdom for sure. And I feel like I feel such a um, I don't know, like a positive energy speaking with you. And then just watching your short film directed by Vincent Zambrano, mm. I just felt like mm. I connected with you. Like if I knew, like if I've known you, you're someone that. I would love to use as an example, like, you know what, check, check him out. You're hot. You're stuck. On your oh, thank phone. you. Check thank him you. Out. Like, that's what I felt like. I wish I could just share you with the whole world and really like have you mentor them. Right. For <laughs> anyone needing. Well, thank you. Um, so I, I absolutely felt that. And that, that's just really coming from my heart. And I was just so excited. And then I, um, I did, I, I did see another interview you did, um, I believe with a college student. And um, you, you were just basically so humbly sharing your story, your experience, your roots, and your foundation, which I know um, you consider, you know, that, that six-year-old mm. you or the time with them going to the museum or being part of that yeah. art class is part of your foundation. Yeah. And I'm big on telling my story and my foundation and mm. how you build right. out from there. So I, I right. really admire I, I, that for sure. Yeah, I think it's important that we do that. I think it's very, very important because when you're, I went, I remember going through phases in my development where I got very discouraged and frustrated and, you know, almost gave up many times and felt that I didn't know what I was doing or why, how it was going to turn out or why I was even doing what I was doing. Right? I didn't have, I didn't have the guidance. Now, I did work, um, I did work for a long time for Audrey Flack and I think her, uh, you know, working for her was was the closest thing I ever came to a mentor. She was really my mentor, and and, and not just not just as a sculptor, but just as an artist and as a person. Right. Like she she you taught me a lot about the her, right? yeah ten years working working with her working for her, and uh, and I'm still actually still do occasionally things for her. I love her. I mean, she's very dear to me, and uh, and it's important to think about. Um, your life is a journey and not expect expect everything to happen at once. And when, when people are beginning 
and I remember this when I was beginning, you, you can feel, you can feel a little disconnected from, from the reasons why you're doing it. And so I am a big believer in people who have that experience sharing with others so that they can, they can find their own path and not get discouraged, not walk away from it when things get hard, because it, it is going to be hard at some point. It doesn't matter, oh, right. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter how wealthy you are or where you come from or what the circumstances of create, putting yourself out there creatively is a, is a, is a, is a risky thing that takes a lot of bravery. And I think people have the resources to do it. They just need to, they just need to have somebody reveal that to them and, and say, and show them that it's possible that they can do it. They can totally do it. I'm That's a big believer in that. Wow. Well, that brings me to your quote. Um, it's hard to be an artist, no matter what genre. That right there is just that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I quoted yeah. you right this there. Is, <laughs> so I see what well, this is doing. why I, I think that's a great, I mean, that's a, that's a great thought too, because, you know, I, I think it doesn't matter what creative pursuit you're, you're, you're taking. Like, obviously what I do is very clear to people. I make, I make representational objects to make figures that are cast in bronze eventually. Um, so it's very clear. People can understand that there's a different, there's a skill level required to do that. But if you're painting abstract, you know, if you're painting uh, abstract expressionist work to do that, well, it takes a skill. I mean, everything requires a commitment that, that is um, uh, somewhat sacrificial and difficult. Um, so that's why for me, when I, when I look at artwork that's new to me, I always give it a chance because I know that the person who made it put a lot into it and that they, you know, that they, they deserve some sort of attention from the viewer to at least right. give them a chance of understanding it. Right. Right. And uh, I'm, I think that's only fair to do across the board, no matter what the genre of art is. And uh, it doesn't mean you have to like everything equally. Obviously we all have our own taste, but oh, yeah. uh, but I'm a big, I, I think that's an important, an important thing for, for young people to, to know that they should, you know, try to give everything a chance, like really look at everything and, and try to understand it and what the artist's motivation were, because you can learn something from that. Right. Uh, you can learn something from things that you don't even understand right away. So. I feel um, like art, art is a universal language. However, when you look mm -hmm. at an art piece, it may speak to you differently from how it speaks to me. Um, so sure. I think that's sure. the thing about art, you know, and in day to day living, art is everywhere. It's absolutely yeah. everywhere. It's it's kind of a mindset, isn't it? It's it's like almost like more of a way of living and a way of thinking about the world, right? Right. It's really it's really a way of moving and living and being in the world, and that's why art can be so many different things. It can be so so diverse because every human experience is, is unique, right? Right. Um, that's what, that's, I'm, I'm with you, I totally agree. This is what I love about art is that, that it, when art is, is, when art is done well, everybody's taking their own experience into it and getting something and taking something else out of it. Right. Uh, so, so it's a, in fact, one, it's one of the reasons why when I'm working, I try not to create pieces that dictate too, too much of what's going on. In the in the in the narrative quality of the piece, I really want to leave it as some some ambiguity there, so that the, so that the viewer can fill in their own information, their own narrative characteristics, uh, and and they're basically essentially everybody's adding to the experience when they look at it. It's not right. just me sort of saying this is what it means. Okay, now accept it or don't. Right? People can accept it on their own terms oh, or yeah. not. That's okay too. Right. Or not. Right. That's the great thing about art. I think um, yeah. you hit it right on the nail there. <laughs> um, so tell me a little bit about your process. I know at some point you do have to um, work with dim different temperatures, if that's the right term, of the clay, whether you have to heat it up or freeze it a bit. Right. Um, I know you have a technique using a, a air duct. Yeah, spraying them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Where yeah. you have to get in there and, and do your detail. And, and that's just such a clever thing. Is that something you just, uh, maybe you, uh, someone, where'd you get that from? Like, did, did it just cross your yeah, mind? Yeah, these, <laughs> there are a lot, well, there, some of the techniques I came up with on my own, but some of them are things that other people 
use and I saw them use them. But that what you're describing right there is uh, I use I use a lot of for a lot of my pieces I use plastiline. Plastiline is an oil based clay. So okay. oil based clay doesn't doesn't have water in it. It it's kind of like a wax. It oh. has a it's more like a like an oily or waxy clay. Um, and so it it um, it's it's rigidity and or plasticity is dependent on the temperature of the clay. So if you warm it up, obviously because it has wax in it, it will get softer. If you get it cold, it will get harder. And so right. when I'm beginning when I'm beginning the sculpting process, when I'm adding a lot of clay and I'm moving it around a lot, composing, then that's when I want it to be soft. I want it to be I want it to be warm because that's going to be the best way to move around the clay to get the, the composition. Uh, now, when I get close to the end and there's a lot of detail that I need to add, that's when I uh, that's when I freeze it through a variety of means so that I can add those details um, in the harder material. So now, if I use another kind of clay, which is a water-based clay, now water-based clay uses uh, is uh, obviously it has water in it, so its its plasticity or its hardness is dependent on how much water content is in it. So right. you have to let it dry out. You have to let it dry out to get it harder to add the details. So it depends on the material I'm using, but primarily I use plastiline to do the pieces that we're seeing now uh, that are in bronze. Uh, but uh, uh, but it is a tricky material, and there, the a lot of people have have difficulty controlling it because they don't know how to how they don't have those techniques at their disposal. They don't know about them for freezing it or or making it softer. But it's really right. just heat dependent. So I mean, I've even had pieces that really small pieces that I put in the freezer or frig- refrigerator and they get hard and I can go in with, and do the detail. Wow. But, uh, so there are lots, there are lots of little techniques you can use. So, and, and uh, p- people are pretty creative with it. <laughs> oh my gosh. So I felt like, I felt like I could do, I mean, I'm not saying as a, as a pro, but I felt like after watching, you know, your video, your short film, your interviews, and I just was like inspired to try it. I'm like, I could try this. <laughs> I don't know what I would. You should come. Maybe I would. You should come to my studio. Come to my studio. I'll give you some clay. (laughs) It's like maybe I'll try to make a mask. Not not a whole. Yeah. Body sculpture. Um. But I was like, maybe I'll try that. (laughs) And I know it's just there's a lot of a lot of steps. I I do know that you refer to the hips being the the main the main direction. Right. The, right. Right. So, the the, so in terms of anat, right. So in terms of anatomy, the the center of the body, the the, the sort of uh, proximal center of the body is the is the pelvic area. So, um, and if you think about it, it makes sense. The pelvic area is where the spinal column comes out of. It's where the the bones for the leg come out of. So it's literally the center of the body. So it's just a practical thing to start with the set the center. The, the pelvic area is where everything sort of comes out of, right? And so practically speaking, that's the, that's the place to begin. But I also find it metaphorically interesting, you know, that that's the, sort of the beginning of life. That's where things are. It's like the, it's the core of the body all, you know. And, right. and so I've, I find it's like a, it's a fascinating, you know, Michelangelo, Michelangelo was, he, he was so fascinated with the torso, the human torso, that, you know, from here to here, from this, this area, Right, because it's so animated. There's so much going on with the musculature and the movement of the body. It's it's a very expressive part of the body. Oh yeah. Um, obviously, yeah. obviously, there are other parts of the body. Well, I find the I find that the the core of the body is also has an expressiveness to it, and uh, so I, I. But mainly, the reason I start when I'm sculpting when I begin a piece. I start with the pelvic region is practical because it's this, it's the literal center of the body, and so uh, so it's just that's part that's primarily a practical concern uh, for for designing a piece. So um, yeah, hopefully that answered that. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, it definitely um, you definitely yeah. did um, answer that, and I know we were talking about it uh, a little in I guess mid slash the beginning about the the mm-hmm. body and you know the language and it just all goes hand in hand um i would probably be a i don't know i'm the type of person that i i talk with my hands a lot so i wouldn't be a great 
still model because I can't sit still, <laughs> but I could definitely be like an off guard model. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm always I'm always observing I'm always observing people even when they're not modeling. I mean, like I'm always observing the way they move, the I'm way they talk, the way they you well. know. Yeah, so did you get a good shot um, of me in your head yet for my sculpture? No, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm working on it. I'm paying attention. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay, so let's get a little. Let's um talk about you, maybe more on a personal level. Where do you collect art, mm-hmm. or what kind of art would mm-hmm. you purchase? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I do collect. I actually have quite a lot of art. I have some of it. Some of the things I have are cast. You can actually see behind me there cast from like a Michelangelo, a couple of Michelangelo pieces, um, piece, their piece of mind. There's, you can't really see it, but there's a paint, there's a painting on this side. Yeah. They're, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm like reversing the camera. <laughs> there's oh, a yeah. painting on this side. There's a, a friend of mine. Um, so I do collect quite a bit. I have, I, I can't show you right now, but I have, I have a lot of paintings, okay. drawings, prints, sculptures from friends, colleagues, people that I, people, I, I like, so to answer your question about collecting, I do collect, but I, I actually primarily collect things from fellow artists, people that are friends or people that I, uh, people that are acquaintances. I like collecting things from, uh, from people that I, um, that I know because it has a sentimental value to me. Right. I like that's being awesome. able to look, I mean, like being able to look at it and say, oh yeah, that's from so-and-so and that's when they took a class from, you know, that person took a class with me or that person was a, you know, we went to school together or we have, you know, I like that kind of like personal attachment to things. Yeah. But I do collect. I also do collect some art from people that I don't know. So it's not one hundred percent only people that are colleagues or friends right. or former students or whatever. But that's that's a lar- large part of my collection. I have a big big collection of paintings, drawings, prints, and some well, sculptures. I, I kind of figured that because I know that your work is not only or has only been featured in the U.S., you're actually a global artist. And so I kind of want to yeah. know, like, are you an art collector as well, as, as, you know, as your journey along the way mm. and you're collecting your own items with or without sentimental value, you know? And I was just curious. Yeah. Right? Really curious of your intake of other artists, which I feel like you definitely have that mentorship, that role model, um, mm. ah, like that, a lot of people don't have that, like that character to be a role model or a mentor. Um, and I, I just really wanted to know, because I do know um, that you also exhibited in group and solo. Right, right, right. Yeah, I, I, um, I, my solo shows have primarily been with uh, Louis K. Mizell Gallery, uh, although I have had some other in other places as well. Right. And uh, uh, that, which is in New York City, of course, you know that. Um, but um, yeah, mo- and a lot of group shows, a lot of museum shows, group shows. And uh, you, know, the, I, you know, the only thing holding me back, you were talking about collecting, the only thing really holding me back from like increasing my collection is, is money. If I had more money, I'd, I'd, I'd buy so much more art. I just love art. <laughs> and you know, I love buying, I like being able to support other people and, and right. uh, put things, put things on the wall. So, unfortunately, most of the things I want, I can't afford right now. Oh. But that's okay. In time, it's in time. Right, right. Well, I, I feel you're so humble. I love it. Um, you mentioned that um, the only, the only failure is failure to act. So I feel yeah. like that comes from experience, from you defeating your own obstacles, that's true. overcoming a lot. So. Um, can we That's get a true. little bit into that, like failure, the word failure? Yeah. Yeah, fail, I think failure is a uh, an often misused word because, and I look, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying this, I'm preaching to myself here too when I say this stuff. Right? Okay. Because I'm just as subject to the to the emotions of ups and downs and most of, most of being human, right? I'm not right. any different from anyone else in that regard. I have plenty of moments where I feel like I fail at something. But really, it's a matter of perspective, isn't it? I mean, like if I'm working on a piece of sculpture and it doesn't come out in a way that's satisfying to me or the way I expected, I can either look at that as a failure or I can look at that as an opportunity to learn something from the experience and then act upon that, act upon what I've learned, right? So it's simply a matter of perspective. It's not, uh, you know, failure is the only, like I said, the only failure is the failure to act. If you don't try to do it, 
then you have failed because you haven't made anything. Right. Like trying to make something and not having it succeed the way you expect is not a failure. That's just a different kind of success. It, it, it's, it's whatever you can extract from the experience that makes it a success or not. Right. So it's, it's very much about living in the moment of the experience and not trying to project too far into the future of your expectations of that particular thing that you're doing. Uh, everything is a learning opportunity. And this is where, this is where it's taken, it took me a long time to get to this point because when I was, when I was younger, uh, I would get very upset when things didn't work the way I wanted. And I would think there were failures and I would destroy them. And I wasn't learning from it because I wasn't giving myself the opportunity to learn. And eventually over time, I started to realize, no, I just have to, I just have to like live in its presence and get like grow from each experience that I have. And, and that's how you, that's how you grow, change as an artist. This is right. how you advance your, your, both your skill set, but also your, your, your way of looking at things. And so, so I, I think I've gotten better at that. I still have my moments where I, where I get discouraged with, with something I'm doing, but, but I let it go a lot quicker. I, I just keep moving and don't stop making things, uh, Again, the the only failure is the failure to act and to do right. something. If, if you do, you, know, you if you do nothing, then you have failed. <laughs> like, that's exactly. because you haven't done anything. Like, so I would but if you do something, I would definitely quote you on that. I'm, that's a caption for me, especially for social media. A lot of people, uh, especially the youth, they look up to me. They want to get into whether it's producing, directing, media. They a yeah. lot of I, I attract a lot of young individuals sure. and I always tell them to pursue you know what they love yeah. and, oh, every day if you're a writer write every day you know a good friend of mine actually yep. he's a public author she also says the same thing mm -hmm. you know to write every day if you're you like yep. to draw, She's draw right. every day you know practice you're right um, I don't yep you know I've done a lot of interviews myself and a common question is um uh, what point did we feel failure or, you know, what after failures? How, I, and then I honestly couldn't answer that. I, I never felt like I failed because I yeah. learned from right. every experience. Uh, absolutely. And, and the thing, and the thing is, Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, and the thing is, you're never going to meet your full expectations, right? Yeah. You're always going to, you're always going to look back at everything you do and see something else that you could have done, see something you could have done differently or see yeah. something else in it that you didn't see the first time. That's the nature of it. That's how you, that's how you go on to the next thing. Like if, yeah. I, here's another way of thinking of it. Like if you felt like, if you felt like you had the perfect success, like you did, like if I made the something that was that I thought, okay, that's the perfect sculpture. Like that there's nothing I could do better on that. Like, well, then I've solved all my problems. Like what, I don't need to sculpt anymore. Like, to, cause <laughs> Because to me, because to me, the act of making it is the is is the point. It's the it's the process that matters, not right. the product. Like right. for my internal be for my internal being, the process is the thing that is is most precious to me and most important. The product is a way of sharing that experience with the rest of the world. But in terms of my own development as a human being. It's the, it's the process of going through it that matters and the process of going from one thing to the next thing, to the next thing. So if you ever felt like you reached the pinnacle and you got to the top, like where else are you going to climb? Right. <laughs> so, right. so when people, like if they're climbing a mountain and they're like, they're like, they, they look up and they're not at the top and they like, Oh, I failed. Now what are they going to do? Turn around and go back. Yeah. Like, no. <laughs> well then you have failed because you haven't. Right. So, so, so looking, looking at what you do at any given moment, you're going, if you have any kind of standards for yourself, you're going to see things that you could improve. And that's, to me, that is success. Yes. Oh my right? God. Well worded. And you know, and another question I really don't like is, it's not that I don't like the question. It's just because mm -hmm. I use parts of my brain that probably many don't. I know, I'm just, I feel like as a creator and I come up with ideas and it's just like, I am mm -hmm. crazy enough to pursue them. So I feel like when I get right. asked questions like, where do you see yourself in five years? Where do you see yourself in 10 years? Hmm. I might have some madness of an idea <laughs> and I could definitely go right. back. <laughs> so my journey right. is my 
my journey. Like, I can't tell you where I would be in five, ten years or where I would like to be. I, of course, I would right. Be, right. I hope to do what I do today. But I'm thinking, sure, you sure, know? sure. Yeah, another way, another way of stating that. I think that's good. I think what you said is, is right. I think that's absolutely correct. Uh, and another way of Thank stating you. that is that, like, so yeah, it's very good. I think that's you know because people often think really a little bit too specific. Like, here's the trick: you don't want to think so specifically about where you want to be in five years that if you if something better happens, you pass it by because you're so fixed on <laughs> something else. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like you know, right? <laughs> like if you said you know. In, in you know, in five days, I'm gonna have whatever your favorite food. I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have steak frites, you know. And yeah. it's like you pass a restaurant, they're like handing like the next day you pass something, you're handing out like something else that's better, you know. And you just pass by because you're so focused on that one meal, yes. you miss yes. you can miss a lot of opportunities. But the other thing is that that built into what you said there, which I think is really important for people to to think about, is that you can have you can have. An, ex, an idea of where you want to be in terms of like a broader idea, but the right. specificity. So you, so you need to have that obviously yeah. because you can't be directionless, but you also <laughs> need to be constant. You need to be constantly reassessing it. So for example, if somebody says to me, where do you want to be in five years? I would say, well, I want to be making more sculpture, right? But what that's going to look like, like what those sculptures going to be, where they're going to go, what they're going to look like, what the material is going to be, that could change. That could all change. I mean, I may, who knows, maybe I'll be living in South Africa, you know, making, making sculptures there. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I like that. See, I don't want to have all the answers. I like the I questions know. better. Right, right, right. <laughs> I don't want to have all the answers. I won't take up no more of your time, but I do want to get into the last signature piece, bronze. Sure. Tell me a little bit right. about your bronze signature. Right. So, you know, bronze is a very, it's a very difficult medium to work in. Technically, it's a, it's a very complicated procedure. So I won't get into, I won't get into all of the steps because it's, okay. it, it might, I might, we might, I might lose the interest of some of the audience from, you know, because if you can't, in other words, it's hard to explain verbally without having some visual aid to, to, right. to describe okay. it. So I'll, I'll, I'll explain it in very basic terms and then, Hopefully that will suffice for people. That's perfect. The so what we what I start with is a clay the clay sculpture, and from the clay sculpture when it's finished, I'll make a mold. So the clay is a positive. Okay, it's a it's a positive form, and you make a mold over that. I use a silicon rubber to make my molds, and then you take apart the mold, and now you have a negative impression of the original positive, right? Okay. So right, so you have the mold is I actually should just find one and show it to you, but I have a bunch in the studio. But anyway, so you make a mold, which is a, ne it's a, which is a, a negative impression of the positive original. Then what you do is you pour wax into the mold and the wax then gets molded, it gets molded as well, okay? So then, the, and then the wax gets melted out of that second mold and the bronze okay. gets poured in wherever the, wa wherever the wax was, okay? Oh, so, okay? So it's a very long process. But my particular way of doing bronze work is I, I have a workshop here and I have assistants that help me that I pay. I work in conjunction with foundries to do some of the some of the the some of the, the pouring of the metal, but then everything else I do here, the welding, the chasing, the patina, all of that. But one of one of the things that I, I do with my bronzes is, is I am very particular about the kinds of surface qualities that I get because I want them to be I want them to have a um, a very, a, I want them to have a, a surface that doesn't really indicate my hand, my my fingerprint, so forth, right? I don't want my, uh, okay. I like say, you know, so in other words, like like you're not seeing, you're not seeing the mark of my my finger on the surface of the of the metal the way it was in the clay, and the reason for that is I really want it to be about the act of looking, the act of observing, the a psychological presence of another human being, right? right? And so in other words, yeah, not about the act of touching because I'm it's. It's now, here, let me just qualify that because everything I say about what I'm doing now, like you said, what am I doing? What do I do in five years? Everything I'm saying now, who knows in five years, I may be doing something completely different, right? I could I be that. making my work, right? I could be making the work. So I don't like, this is, this is why artists don't like artist statements because we're always afraid. We don't want to lock ourselves into something. 
There, I know there are necessary. There, well, I won't lock you into thing. anything. <laughs> no, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, but but you know, so so having said all of that, procedurally, who knows? I, I I'm constantly wanting to experiment. In fact, right now in my studio, I'm doing a bunch of terracotta pieces, which will not require molding and casting in the same way. They're going to be fired in a kiln. So uh, so it's a completely different process from the bronze work. And one of the reasons that I'm doing it is I wanted to maintain some of that immediacy and some of the marks of my tools and my hands. So I'm, in some ways, I'm kind of doing the opposite with these newer sketches. They're more like sketches, right. maybe, in clay. Okay. Um, so I'm trying to – because I think it's important when you're working, you can get good at certain things, and then they become kind of routine, and you start to repeat yourself. And so I like to try something new every now and then like a new technique, a new material, a new scale, a new approach to, to the subject matter. And that just keeps me from getting stale in my process. Right. Right. Uh, so, so I'm not abandoning the things that I, the way, the things that you see and you, I still have them. In fact, I have two sculptures I'm doing here of my daughters uh, and they're 14 and 16. I'm doing this. Oh, wow. I want to do this series. Yeah. I want to do these pieces about the transition from child to adult and that, that sort of middle phase that everybody, awkward middle phase everybody goes through. And uh, so I have two pieces that I'm working on with them. And in addition to the terracottas, which are using male and female models. So I have a lot of different things happening. So I, uh, despite the fact that primarily my work is the bronzes that you know, I do have other things constantly going on, sometimes drawing in the studio, uh, sketching in you know, paper, charcoal, that sort of thing too. So I, I think it's a very important thing for people to, to, to do in their artistic practice to make sure that you pepper in some, some new approaches, something to, right. to challenge, your, challenge your way of, of doing things and uh, uh, get out of your comfort zone a little bit, right? I think it's a very important thing. It doesn't mean you have to abandon what you're doing. Just right. you, can add another, you can add another layer to your artistic practice, and right. it's very important. Right. It's like adding skill sets to your resume, right? Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. I, I definitely yeah. could sure. talk to you all day probably and pick your brain, but I won't do that to you. Um, I do, that would be fun. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> I do. Um, that would be fun. I'm spending time with you in your art mm -hmm. studio and just creating something simple, nothing crazy because that's not my – that's not my forte. <laughs> that's not what I'm great at, but I could always try something new. Um, if there's well, you're, else, you're, oh, I was going to say, you're welcome to visit anytime. Just let me oh, know. Thank you. I'm not, thank you. I'm not too far from you. I'm in, I'm in Pennsylvania, you're New Jersey. So huh? yes, I'm not far at all. And I love road trips. So I may hold you to that, <laughs> but is there That's anything okay. <laughs> else you'd like to share with us or any upcoming workshops that you may have? Good question. Um, yeah. So I typically, typically I do uh, summer workshops in Rome every year. Unfortunately, COVID has really made all of that difficult. Um, I, I've, I do a lot of workshops overseas. Uh, my main thing is doing workshops in Rome, May, June. Uh, and I don't know if that's happening right now. We're waiting to see what the travel restrictions are going to be. Right. Um, I, I do also sometimes teach in Brazil, South Africa. I have trips planned to Australia to teach. But all of that is up in the air. So what I think I'm going to do is... I'll probably have two sculpture workshops here in my studio in July. Okay. So, so that's the, that's the, the, the probably the safest thing to announce just because yeah. I, um, I, you know, because I, it's the travel isn't much, as much of a, a difficulty for people. Um, so hopefully everything will get back to normal on the other fronts, but, but for now, that's what I have planned. I'm going to do, do workshops here in my studio, a couple of one week sculpture workshops using a model, uh, wow. about 10 people, 10 people per class. Okay. So that's what I planned. And yeah. So I don't have it on my website yet, but oh, I'm sorry. Anyone, anyone Neither can join. Experts. Anyone can join. Yep. Yep. I like the. I actually like the. I actually like having the range of people in the classroom. I like having some people that have more experience and some people have less experience because it, it really it gives. I think it creates a more dynamic environment so that people yeah. who are beginning can see can see various approaches. Um, for people who have more experience and people who have more experience then can that they can remember what it was like to, to be at the beginning right. and remind themselves of what it took to get there. So I think it's a good thing to have like that. And I'm very good at, 
Yeah, and I'm very good at adapting my instruction to each person as I go around the room according to their needs right. uh, with the same subject matter. So if it's somebody who's just beginning, I try to keep it really basic, really basic information and get them get them focused on that, those essentials. And then for more advanced people, I can move into other things, right? Uh, more more, complica- more complicated matters. More technical. But anyone can take more anyone. More technical. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. That's good right. to know. So someone like yeah. me with no experience, okay, could join. You could take the class. You could totally take the That's class. That's awesome. Absolutely. And <laughs> I will congratulate you on being on the cover on the most influential art magazine as Thank well. Thank you. Congratulations Thank you. for that. And it was definitely a pleasure speaking with you and getting to know you. And honestly, I already knew I, I, I could talk to you forever. And just watching your short film, mm. watching interviews and reading about you and your artwork, it is really inspiring. It really is. And I well, feel thank you, Tori. you're very humble. And I, I know with all your achievements and milestones that you are paying it forward within your workshops or even just sharing your art. So that, that's really Oh, thank you. I appreciate that.